Hello, hello, hello! Guys, give yourselves a big hand for being here! It's so awesome to see so many of you. Can you hear me well? The room is a little boomy. The acoustics are not the best. So I want to ask uh, for your forbearance. Uh, and I also want to ask all the readers, all the readers uh, that we have today with a great lineup. Please read slowly, leisurely, and crisply, if you can, okay? So I'm just so happy to see all of you. Welcome to the Singapore Writers' Festival 2015. And tonight is the, today is the first full day of the festival, as you know, and this event is the epic international poetry reading. We've got seven excellent, excellent writers from all over the world who are going to come here. And today is a sampler platter. All the best writing in the region uh, and internationally around the world will be sharing with us uh, their, their writing. So please uh, do warmly welcome them. Okay? I'll introduce each of them in turn. So for the time being, I'd like you to just sit back, relax and enjoy. Oh, but before I do that, duty calls. I need to say a very special and warm thanks to our key program and venue partner, The Arts House. Please give them a round of applause. Okay, would you please, in a typical Singaporean manner, turn all your beeping devices to silent or turn them off so that we can all enjoy this evening's program? And uh, please be reminded also that while you can take uh, pictures and video, uh, flash photography is not allowed. Uh, don't blame me if the writers throw something at you, okay? So without further ado, we've got a very warm welcome uh, from uh, some Singaporean uh, or international dancers. Uh, today's, this festival's theme is the Island of Dreams. So the, um, the dancers from Kapa Hula, Kale Maile Hilani are here to give you all a very warm welcome. Let's welcome them.
Thank you so much. Let's give another round of applause to our dancers. So without any more ado, uh, good people. We're going to kick off the readings, and the very first one, a special guest all the way from Japan, Miss Mina Ishikawa. She's one of the most highly regarded young tanka poets in Japan, and her poetry is story-oriented and full of whimsical humor. And uh, she, uh, together with all our other special um, uh, guests for today, will be uh, appearing in other panels and readings uh, throughout this week, so please do look out for her. Miss Mina Ishikawa will be accompanied by her translator, Mr. Moto. Good evening. Nimen hao. Salamat malau. Good evening, my name is Mina Ishikawa. I write tanka poems, which are a traditional Japanese form of poetry. Tanka to a go, shi, go, shi, shi, no, sanju, ichi, on, karanaritatsu, totemo, mijikai, shi, no, koto, desu. 
Tanka is a very sh a short form of poetry which consists of 31 syllables, 57577. All the major Japanese newspapers uh, carry, carry a section of uh, uh, Tanka poems contributed by readers. 最近ではTwitterなどのSNSで単価を始める人も出ています。Nowadays, uh, some people start writing Tanka via uh, as SNS such as Twitter. Tankaは伝統的なしであると同時に常に最先端の詩でもあります。So Tanka is not just a traditional form of poetry, but always has been the most modern form of poetry too. では、まずこれから一首読んでみたいと思います。あの、意味はわからなくてもいいので、まずこの長さを感じてください。So I start by reading one piece of tanka. You don't have to understand what it it's about. You just please feel how long or how short it is. 美術館館長 that's one piece of tanka. I think it took me to read it, maybe five, six or seven seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it took me to read it, maybe six or seven seconds. So what's great about tanka is in, within that short form, you can put in so many different emotions, images, and stories. I'm going to read from a, a series of tanka called Tales in Tanka. So this collection is a very unusual one in which all pieces are end with the word hanashi, which means tale or poetry uh, or story. But uh, in, in English translation, actually, it starts with the word a tale. <laughs> so my hope is that you get sense uh, from each piece of a fragment of a story or the whole story even. この物語集の this collection is uh, uh, consists of more than uh, 50 uh, pieces like this so you can you know, shuffle in one, one piece of poem on each card and, uh, so, so you can you know uh, 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 read in whatever order you like uh, but to, tonight, I'm going to read 70, 17 pieces out of them. So I'm going to read it in the, in, in the original in Japanese, and my translator is going to read it in English. Tales in Tanka. 美術館館長T が残したる小さな鍵についての話。A tale about a tiny key bequeathed by the late art museum director T. 捨ててきた左の腕が血を張って雨のよドアをノックする話。A tale in which a discarded left arm creeps to knock on its owner's door one rainy night. 免許証に記載されたる住所から遠く離れて語れる話。A tale told far away from the address on the driver's license. 銀縁の眼鏡をかけて二人行く悪の道華やかなる話。A tale recounting the splendorous evil ways of a couple with silver rimmed glasses. 失いし言葉を探す旅路にて七度落とす命の話。A 
a tale of a life lost seven times on the quest for missing words. Nodo ni ana o aketa kotomo ga hiu hiu to oto tate aruku sabaku no hanashi. A tale about a desert where a child with a hole in his throat walks wheezing. Gozen niji no lobby ni tsudo u roku nin no gongin ni kage ga nakatta hanashi. A tale of six people meeting in a lobby at 2 a.m., five lacking shadows. Rinkaku no miruma ni usure kie yuku o A tale in which his outline faded fast, and though I held him tight, he disappeared. Nemuru inu no shizuka na yume o yokogirite, sekai o ou tsubasa no hanashi. A tale of wings that soar through a dog's silent dream to cover the universe. Karada jun ni koko wa nurarete, A tale where a fresh sheet is ruined when someone smears your body with cocoa. A tale in which the wild grapes I absent mindedly pop into my mouth becomes your finger. A tale which spent 700 pages on the two hours before the brawl began. A tale about the dreadful teeth of a maniacal baseball manager so ravenous he devoured his players. A tale in which every last book abruptly sprouts arms and legs and flees planet Earth. A tale of a man who plunges into a ravine crying, I never intended to cheat on you. A tale where on the day I leave, I give him a small key I've warmed in my coat. A tale where on the day I leave, I give him a small key I've warmed in my coat. A tale where on the day I leave, I give him Thank you very much. Thank you. What a special way to begin our evening of epic international poetry. Wouldn't you agree? All right. Thank you, Mina. Thank you also to Mr. Moto. We enjoyed both the Japanese and the English、uh, readings. Thank you. Our very next writer who's going to read for us hails from Australia. He's written four collections of poetry, one book of comic poetry, and also edited uh, uh, some anthologies. So he's a true blue hardcore poet.、Uh, give it up for Michael Farrell. Thank you. Uh, a couple of the poems in this book were attacked in the newspaper in Australia for not making sense.、<laughs> um, this one, I think, pretty much in the title tells you what, what it is, and it is a small collage of a colonial poet quite well known called Mary Fullerton.、Um, Sweet Shell Awakes, Fullerton Edit. Pain or the dew at the dawn, 
Cold, cold was your glance and careless your eyes in a violet abyss there gathers the soul of kiss as the winds take the north a stormy embrace he shall frost from your indolent face and gentle and sweet as the south kiss in the bloom on the mouth tossed on the sea what is your me dainty and delicate with the waves rough safely enough never a crack or your gentle genie have well tell me why of your fair frame went your tiny guest say how spans of spans of strife raptures of love thank you uh, this this next poem and they're going to get exponentially longer but I'm only doing three um, I don't know if Kimba was shown on TV in Singapore does anyone know what Kimba is yeah. one voice it's probably in Australia it's about a very romantic young baby white lion um, so that's the only thing I'll explain Beautiful mother, you've always associated the two terms together, partly due to your reading of Schiller, partly due to your watching of Kimba. Kimba sublimates his mother in the water. You've always thought your mother a Baroque figure. You go into the forest. You make something from a tree, a book, a club. Material comes from the mother, also happiness and therefore beauty. The mother expects love and finds it, finds it beautiful. The son cries white tears, imagines them surf, a cliff, an iceberg with beer beneath its surface. The book says tree or mediation. The club says tree or mediation. The Virgin Mary is prompted to speak by the movement of the baby in her womb. She speaks Hebrew. Hu boet kamor mumze. He kicks like a bastard. She defines a kind of democracy. Her followers meet with her at the temple. Her son, now 12, is somewhere swimming or sublimating his mother in the forest. He is a kind of book or club. He starts drinking wine early. He refuses to go into the army. He has to go across the border to another country. He works at a cement factory there. When the men knock off, the women dance with him. He's homesick and drinks whiskey. Eventually, he swims back across the border. The trees hang over the river. He can't tell whether he or they are happy or beautiful. He sees his mother in the sky. The stars are heavy, dramatic. The army still desires him. There is book and club mediation. His mother prays for his happiness. He builds a tower out of beer cans and critics say it's beautiful. So he builds a whole city and people start to live there, practicing a form of democracy. Eventually, the area is annexed by Spain. You tell me all this, mixing art history together with stories of your mother. You didn't want to go into the army either but it was in the army that you first found love. It was a secret you kept from your mother. Your mother was not a cartoon, nor was she a political or religious figure, yet you mapped her, in a sense, in the sky. She spoke about you quite differently. She said that she had taken you from a tree. It was dark, and she hadn't known exactly what you were, whether text or weapon or musical instrument that you were a wooden boy was a complete surprise. Uh, this poem, I'll just explain, the word, uh, explain that the bunyip that appears at the end of the poem is a mythological figure. 
Indigenous Australian figure. Um, you'll see why I chose this poem. <laughs> My LO is probably freaking out. An Australian comedy. He's learning to see other men as third person cinema, latent with photographs, the laughter knife in the lost jar. He's brought his dog with him, so for more a thing to do, but they're inseparable, like glass. A grasshopper lands on the robot's instructions, and the clothes are grasshoppered for a week. A timeless street is rezoned and crumbles. George is here from Singapore, wants to know where the place to be is, if it's Asian friendly. You are aging with your hands in your pouch, your strong tail a seesaw. If the reader is willing to decide what's missing, the question remains whether to fill the void or expand it. We differ, but I have better sportswear. Turn around, Bell is Dell, Belong is Geelong. The horses are running, their tongues and hooves all part of the assembly. You see the old photographs in your lover's face and let go of the schoolboy's hand. You're growing up again. It turned out there was a god behind that tree and we talked a bit about it. The ferry came. They say they don't know yet make noises at night like possums swallowing loads of ants and throwing them up again. A wicked waste. There in the bed, in the middle, yet somehow separate, lie Sartre and Beauvoir. George finds a, piece of uh, finds a piece of shade shaped like Finland and lies down on a buckthorn. The dog orders curry through the record player, but it never arrives. The flags say, help, we're out of musicians. The Rolling Stones arrive to talk about their glass-making hobby. A grasshopper lies down in shade, the shape of Broadway, or else the head of John the Baptist. What planets are the best for poets to be born under? The rhinus knife in the temporary jar. He let theatre speak for him. Folly, mortology, a jumper that claims to read Thomas Hardy, but really just follows the plot. Ordinary index, insult, and injury. Their noble values are debatable. He was looking for Asian spinach in a non-Asian grocer's. What's missing is inevitably there. The goat farm was forced to wear a mute button. That was the smell their neighbors went to war over. The poem stretches like an apple. Composed using conceptually thin words was the screen advice. The rabbit and badger, both heraldic animals of England, both associated with unpleasant talk. After dinner, we wait for the billy to babble filling our mouths with dread, which is good for the drain. If a forest creature, like a sentence, a Japanese nephew called the Japanese, gave them Gertrude Stein every Christmas, fearing that Samuel Beckett would be too gloomy, too goat farmy, for the same reason he never included them on links to news stories about police officers bashing, police officers bashing people to death. The gay one made counting uncomfortable, and the resourceful Anglicans invented a new number, half two. Half two seemed to embody the ultimate, 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 ultimate state for people, and evoked for George the novel by Frederick Rolfe, Desire in Pursuit of the Whole. Your name, as they say, here. The tracksuit lies down in the shadow of a porridge truck and is stained by a passing koala. Following the tenets of minimalism, you remove the stirrup from the pancake. It tastes fine without it. Every line on his lover's face invites him on an eerie journey. There's an Anglican phone line that flatters the over 40s. Press half two to hear you look just over 30. Every day he drops an orange on something, nothing learned about that. It's acting like a possum in a tree without a tree. The leaf blower came. What a waste of ants. He came home to find divine in the shadow of the garbage bin. 
He was snoring the tune of Waltzy Matilda. Nyuck, 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 nyuck. But on waking, claimed to not know the song. The smell of dog food came through the speakers, but no one thought to turn the record off. The flags say, help, we were out of Daddy Cool, and Mondo Rock came and talked about those early days by the river of Babylon, of cowboy hats and Molly Meldrum, when every mother wanted a gay one under a gay sun, all the while knitting with boot polish. Mars shines down on the grasshopper in its bowl, the trouser knife in the bedroom jar. He was hot and small, like a haiku in a microwave. George had to undress him just to stop the windows steaming. So many kinds of cabbage the ca English have. Shiny cabbage, poor cabbage, park cabbage, I think. Really? Many kinds of quack, too. English quack, Scots quack, Australian quack, American quack. The goat wanted poster stretched around the apple tree, so it was spared. Text before progress is a saying. The merlion is Singapore's heraldic animal, but like the rabbit and badger, there is no taboo against eating it. There are several restaurants in Chinatown where you can get a merlion toasted at your table. They make good yard pets as long as you have a pond. After 15 cups of tea, you feel like a string of bucks that dusk for money in the twilight, listening to the tragedies issuing from the cathedral and throwing in joke grenades, the stirrup spoon stirring in the pancake jar. He licks it, his tongue like an exploding cocoon. His feet act like possums, a waste. The dog is miming, the careless whistle of a good friend. The flags say, we want overtime and refuse to even cast shadows on the poor swaggy lost in the 21st century. Some say he used to be an Anglican bishop, but he seems to have a dignity about him as he tries to buy a cabbage online. It's a beauty for the right people, the ad says but it sounds like duty and it tastes like it too. Australians like to see alternative farm animals, Durky, turkeys, donkeys, it's too boring otherwise, driving down the information highway, seeing dog DJs now turned, swaggies with their records under their arms that they heat up over campfires, waiting for a track to spin them to perdition or wherever you go in a secular universe. Poetry anthologies pile up by the side of the internet, rusty as a prayer belt, while witches dance around them in army uniform. One thing about the army is you don't get to go into art galleries much. If you're on leave, you can duck into the big museums, but you miss those little galleries. That's where it's all going on. And you know so often the big ones are undergoing renovations just while you're in town. The war dead lie down in the shadow of the goat farm. A bunyip reclines on its non-novel reading arm. It's probably just a pig showing off. Two larrikins. They have a knifely charm. They're on, a, they're there on a date. What are you into, mate? They say, like a couple of badly translated flags or figs. Grasshoppers wait confidently for the syrup. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for those sharing with us those special uh, flavors and images and even sounds of Australia. Our next reader, Mie Mon Luin, comes from Myanmar. Luin is an accomplished writer in many genres. He writes poetry, short fiction, novels. He's also a publisher, and he's just received last year the IPA uh, Freedom to Publish Prize. Luin, you're a national treasure. Please welcome Luin. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad to change read my poetry in front of all the lively audience. <clears throat> the name of my poetry is A Fish Jump Up of the Spawn. I'm enjoying the square suit, so why the last mouthful or two? When a fish lands on my spawn, a live fish, no less than spouting walls or whistling, honestly, you see, there's no such thing as a fish to them to distinguish between a favorite one and live one. 
It's just that only the brave fish are prepared to bite the bait. Cowboy fish escape in the deep water, growing into mad to hide from human. Rare is the fish that survive the hook, reaching the table, life and home. A legend. There and caught a species man like myself. Generation of fish were born to such legends. Could I imagine as the fish on my spawn? The way black gets out of the gullet of fish brain and has to bite the bay. Could I possibly imagine what it feels like? Yet, yeah, how easily frightened we are. We, spawn within lava of fish. It's never fair to astonish to fish skinning. We, the adventurous, the risk taking species, eat the flesh of other creatures. Yet we panic when a mother of meat get caught in crud between our teeth. Then we go it with a tubes like crazy, hilarious, really. If only we human could be brave, said the fish on my spawn. Brave enough to pancure our gula and spread black for the sake of mere bite of food. Now, just go ahead and trim me up, said the fish in pardon. After spitting out my spawn, of course. So saving, it's jamming out of the spawn into my mouth. Now, why can't I bring myself to wash that spawn? Thank you. Uh, the second and last paper in for this meaning is eight flow through poetry. Give me a quiet place, step after a step. Sound of beer bodies in hand. The small staircase in total darkness. It is so late. There will be a third flow after the second flow. I see a chain of sensory. I see the thought of a lamppost. Take care of full step. Keep on going out. Don't think about your exhaustion. It changes the feel of imaginations, keep on going up on the stair. Where is the package of peanuts? Are they in my plastic bag? Cheer on coming down, oh, don't make noise, kids. You should be sleeping now. This is not for you, this is not for you, this is not for you, this is not for you. And keep on going at with my ration in my hand. We say allow not to think about tiredness. Having some some, keep on going at one fly or stay after on the other and day your destination. Why are there so many fly of stay? Why didn't they make them strange? Don't think about it. None of your business. Go on a step after a step. By the way, where are you going now? To Lima? To Anshui? Don't think so much. The main purpose is to get the upstairs easily. Keep on going step by step. Don't make a mistake. Keep on going up. Now arriving higher. This may be the final flight of stair. Don't be tired. Keep on ahead. I'm now on a eighth floor. The flat is luck from outside. With not just one, but two luck. However, I should knock the door. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luin. Just such unique rhythms and such a spirited and lively reading. Thank you so much. Uh, our very next reader is Ravi Shankar from the US. Oh, he's got a whole ton. His CV is very long, actually. Uh, <laughs> I had the pleasure to be in Manila with uh, Ravi last week uh, when he taught a fantastic poetry writing workshop. So, um, well, just very briefly, uh, he is the Pushcart Prize winning poet who founded Drunken Boat, which is one of the world's oldest electronic journals of the arts. He's edited some fantastic anthologies of poetry uh, from all over the world, including from Singapore. Um, 
He's got a lovely uh, book that I was just reading the other day. What else could it be? Ekphrastics and collaborations, in which you really just got together and collaborated with different poets in writing poems that were inspired by other forms of art. He's currently a professor of English at Central Connecticut State University and also in the International MFA program of the City University of Hong Kong. Please give a warm welcome to Ravi Shankar. Thank you, Aaron. And thanks to all of you, to Khao Chai and the entire festival. It's been terrific so far and uh, more to come. So, uh, as Aaron was saying, uh, I have this new book out. It's quite different than anything I've written because the work is primarily collaborative in nature. And I thought I would read a few poems from this and then I'll finish with a newer poem. Uh, the way some of you that were in the last panel that I was on, I talked a bit about this process, but what I did was I came up with a, a dozen potential starting lines and I sent them to various poets from around the world. I said, if any of these speak to you, build on it, send it back to me. We went back and forth. And when they really worked, I think that you can't tell who's writing what. It's this kind of third voice that emerges. And it seems appropriate to start uh, with the collaboration I did with Alvin. Uh, and Alvin and I actually have edited this anthology called Union, which we'll be launching tomorrow. I think Aaron has poems in it. Oh, yes, there it is. Tomorrow, in the, uh, right here in the Arts House. So hopefully some of you can make it there. Um, so this is, uh, and feel free to just uh, hold applause till the end of my reading. Um, this is my collaboration with Alvin Pang. It's called All Tomorrow's Ancestors. Burnt out taxis rust like lozenges on a tongue of rain. The road last traveled barely rode, nearly desert now. Parched, coarse as a lunar surface, erasing the footprints of people whose ancestors once drank yak's milk tea. Prayer flags, hunting horns, folk remedies, a child's first toy on the broken counter. Coins spilt unsmiling on the floor to oxidize coppery green in the ensuing years with a value far from intrinsic. If these relics store a certain ritual magic, a way of perceiving the world foreign to the wire generation, then the tap the trapped energies outwits time. Time was, Grandpa says, the sea came all the way up here where your uncle lost his faith to silence. Its ebb a breaking into form as of a canvas marred by paint to create another wholeness. Stained hours, fibrous days, the span of sutures between bones of the skull, glimpsed through teeming blood cells, unsensed by microscope for millennia, until an unschooled Dutch linen draper stretched soda lime glass in a flame to magnify a universe of corkscrewing, cascading microbial creatures in a single drop of pond water. See, we all came up that way. That way was time, says Grandpa, wrapped in a blanket, gesticulating eyes turned inwards, here where faith lost silence, the shoreline abrades the ear. What do we know of time but its departures? The fossil air stiffens into breeze, into heat, falls light over itself in waves, impossible to trace without smearing the instruments with agency, particularizing whatever will be. Thank you. All right. Uh, this next one, so I, I actually have some ekphrastic poems, but also poems about musicians and dancers, and uh, you probably will recognize the figure here, which is Frank Sinatra. And this is actually the centenary of Sinatra's birth. He was born in 1915, and so this is a poem that is dedicated to Frank Sinatra. It actually uses the inflections of a great poem by Frank O'Hara called The Day Lady Died. I don't know if people know that poem. If you don't, you should look it up, and you'll hear that in the background of this. Uh, this is called The Day the Voice Died. And in each case, when I wrote one of these poems, I include a little epigraph from the artist in question. And in this case, the quote from Frank Sinatra is, if you possess something but can't give it away, then you don't possess it. It possesses you. The day the voice died. It is nearly 1.50 in New York, a Thursday, Dante Alighieri and George Lucas's birthday, anniversary of the day Jamestown was settled. 
Yes, and it is not last call, not in the self-proclaimed center of the world, where the gas is poured till the slivery moon is closer to light than dark, and I'm boxed in by finks who think they're big leaguers when the games wiffle ball, pawn their cell phones and high-fiving, and wouldn't have been perfect if blue eyes came on the jukebox and a busload of bobby soxers poured in. But no, this is real life, 1998, and I'm holding a watered-down vodka tonic in a haze of smoke. And there are no screws wearing suits with fabric finer in the lining than upon slim lapels. No crooning, no loose swagger, hardly anyone carrying a Zippo and a roll of dimes. And I will finish my drink, walk down the avenue of the Americas to the ACE line running local, moving slower than I should, in synchronicity with cabs idling curbside. And across the Hudson, Hoboken, which I can't see, glittering languidly. One might even say, except for this fact of real life, in a pose of mourning, pouring wave after wave of brass and bel canto from here to eternity. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'll read one more small collaboration here. It's uh, one of the smallest collaborations, and I want to read it because it started out as one of the longest. It was a literally 10-page poem, and we kind of went back and forth and compressed it into this small little gem. Uh, it's called Broca's Area, which is the part of the brain that processes language. It's a collaboration with the poet Nancy Kuhl, po poetry co curator of the Beinecke Library at Yale. No beveled jewel, jagged, rock-faced cliff edge, where mountain dreams itself to mist from riverbed. No ancient fault line, no memory of catastrophe, only breath. One enters, another departs. This is a perpetual discordance between thinking and thought, an impossible figure, preserved groove and catch, fixed into flux, fossilized, finalized, a form we almost recognize. A feather or bone, the skin, the shell, the body, that intimate shape, like a name or any word, held too long on the tongue. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'll, I'm gonna finish with uh, this poem here because I promised Darren that I would read it, and he's not even here, I don't see. Darren from Fiji, where are you at? Yeah, I don't think he's here, but uh, this, this poem is uh, dedicated uh, to Darren, and really, um, just to give you a little backstory, um, I, I wrote this poem when I was teaching a writing workshop at a woman's prison in Connecticut. It's the Niantic uh, Correctional Institute, and I went in for about a month, and I gave these workshops to these women who were really immensely grateful that I was coming in to work with them. And we, we would uh, do writing exercises, and they were all really dedicated, uh, except for this one woman who sat in the back, and she didn't say anything. And after my first day, you know, and I was really quite nervous, and you know, trying really hard, and the, the first day she didn't say anything, and at the end of class she looked at me and she said, I don't care what you say, there ain't no poet better than Tupac. That's <laughs> what so she said, and I said, okay, well, you know, let's bring some Tupac in, we'll do some scansion on Tupac, you know, and uh, so th throughout this, everyone was involved, but she didn't really say anything, and we continued reading po poems and uh, sharing them, and on the last day, which was kind of emotional, everyone was really... Uh, you know, sad to see me go, and I felt very touched by how hard they'd worked. This, this woman who had said this kind of stayed in the back of the room when everyone left, and then as everyone was leaving, she came up to me and she said, you know what, I think Walt Whitman might be almost as good as Tupac. <laughs> uh, and so this is uh, uh, dedicated to the women of the York Correctional Institute, and I thought I'd write a poem imagining what it would be like if Walt Whitman, in fact, were Tupac. Uh, and this is a kind of a collaborative poem. I'm going to need your help because there's a little chorus. So when you hear, word over all, beautiful as sky, I want you to give it back to me, all right? So let, let's practice. Word over all, beautiful as sky. All right, come on, a little louder, a little more enthusiasm. One more time. Word over all, beautiful as sky. All right, so this is MC Walt and the Body Electric. Word over all, beautiful as sky. Word, the bard is my title. 
but names are not vital for you to get thrown upon this musical shuttle over the sterile sands down from the showered halo, knocking imitators down with the strength of my recital. Just to let you know, I stop, I go, ebb stung by flow down from the Mississippi up past the 730. Cloverleaf Freeway, let me see you sway from the roof of my mouth down to the dirty south. Sing the body electric, bone by brick. I prick each nerve until it curves a walking stick to old men with beards dark as grass. Hear that, old captain, I'll make you bounce up off that ass. Listen to the clash of brass, see foam dance upon a beer glass because no universe can be forecast. Remains a procession, spontaneous jam session. A couple of war vets shooting CeeLo with their pension checks wrecked on a case of long necks like specks of dust. Rims flecked with rust, limbs joined in trust, singing hymns charged by lust. They belong to us. You and I, even after we die, word over all, beautiful as sky. I hear America singing, singing Greece, dropping bombs, release priests from compunction for compassion. Dysfunction stays in faction, bringing us versus them. When I'd rather not condemn like Eminem, bust a rhyme that reminds a dime bag of weed was once a seed I held in my palm. The germ of a green psalm, confirming one creed with the plum. Assalam alikam. The words my home skillet, mash it up like hog millet. Slop it on my plate before I grill it or chill it. Let me dine on this universal hieroglyphic barehanded. No need for knife and a fork or hoods and a cuff. If I exist as I am, then that is enough. Try to deny, player, but I'd rather you reply. Word over all, beautiful as sky. Who's out of the cradle rocking endlessly? It's the MCWALT. Who sits in the shade pondering silently? It's the MCWALT. Who thinks the mystic de delirium most fervently? It's the MCWALT. Who speaks to each stranger as you speak to me? It's the MCWALT. So when accrued, I contain multitudes. Time, when accrued, I contain multitudes. New Jacks and OGs, time and space. Hustlers and pimps, the whole human race. There's no place I haven't been where I will not go. No levy or dam that can staunch this flow. It's trackless, vast, divine, unsurpassed. Dry and bubbly like Moet and Chandon. Put your dew in a perm like a hair salon. I don't represent East Side or West Side, but the Milky Way. Pastures to forest to the Quai d'Orsay, from bowling alleys to river valleys, to all you can eat buffets, from the cats with dookie ropes or missing their teeth, to uptight social lights who can't eat or sleep. I'm not above or below anything you see, an acme of things accomplished, an enclosure of things to be. So shout out for yourself if you shout out for me. I'm just an MC with the gift of gab, not locking it down for the cheddar or for the hood rats. Not doing it for myself unless by me you mean you, fit and flavor in ears like Reebok fit shoes, leaving you and I, even after we die, hurling words like birds in the sky. Thank you very much. See, okay. I'm really proud to uh, introduce the next reader to you. He's a fellow Singaporean. His name is Tang Jui Piao. He is a graduate in Chinese language and literature uh, from Fudan University in Shanghai. In 2013, he won the most prestigious prize for budding uh, poets in Singapore, the Golden Point Award. And he's just got his first book of poems out this year. It's called The Sea Diary. Tang Jui Piao. Hello. I'm truly happy to be um, to share the stage with six very established um, poets. Um, it's almost like a dream, island of dreams. Um, <laughs> reading poetry in orchid gardens, and one of the poets um, today is my high school English teacher. So, <laughs> so it's almost like a dream. Um, I write in Chinese, and Chinese philosophers um, always say that life is like a dream. But um, in this very um, increasingly, increasingly globalized, modernized, um, urbanized world, um, this notion of dream, reverie, or narrows is losing its sense. So, um, and what, what rises is a sense of solitude as well. So for my writing, um, the sea diary, Hang Hai Ji Shi, so I write about um, some of the random moments that I encountered, um, some senses of uh, uncertainty, unpredictability. I, I would want to say that you know, like in Singapore, everything is uh, probably very well planned and things that are quite predictable. You know when the next train is coming, but I think I, I wouldn't use that example anymore. <laughs> yeah, so um, 
some of the places that I choose uh, to write about is cemetery, uh, army camps, playgrounds, um, certain words that I've heard, uh, countries um, that I've been to that promises a lot of surprises. So today I'll share with you um, some poems. Um, all of them are written in Chinese. One of it um, is a poem that I wrote in India. So my friend Samantha To has translated it into English, so I shall read the English version first. The Sacred Cows. In blistering heat, cows by the roadside, soothe each against lamppost. At crossroads, the cars that trundle in all directions are fat men. The sound of horns. Cows lie supines in the road center, basking in the sun. Three cows rummage trash and do not stop, swinging their tails. Evening, a herd of white cows pass. The faithful bow, hands crossed in prayer. I shall read the Chinese version. Shen niu men. Yan yang xia, niu zai lu pang, dian deng gan sao yang. Shi zi lu kou, si chu chuan xing de che liang ru pang zi. Che di shen, niu tang wo zai lu zhong yang, sai zhe tai yang. San niu tou fan nong la ji cao, bu ting de, yao huang zhe wei ba. Ban wan, yi tou bai niu jing guo. Uh, end of the poem. <laughs> um, the next poem is called The Handmade Porcelain. Of course, all porcelains are handmade. Um, it's opposed to plastic cups, uh, ready-made um, ceramics, uh, for the matter. There are four parts to it. The first is about pottery and the urn. So for the Chinese, the urn is a container for our family members uh, ash after cremation. And to us, this container holds great um, significance. It's as if we could hold on to our beloved family members or friends in our hands after they died. There are four parts to it. So the second is about the clay that I see under the HDB flat, um, my, my flat that I live in, when there were works going on to build a new playground. But to build this new playground, we have to keep digging, and it's quite an oxymoron to me. The third part is on the ancient way of firing pottery. And the last part is about the dragon kiln in Singapore, the last existing one. Um, I shall read to you two um, Chinese verses. Um, I, do, I don't have an English version for this. Um, I'm not trained in translation for literary um, works, so I shall not embarrass myself. Shogongsi, <laughs> <laughs> Fenrenti,火化后 工程挖出的土总是熟悉的陶泥红，树根、大雨后露骨、浓水泥滩、树与树凝望着白刷的游乐场诞生。That's the end of poem. Um, the last one that I like to share with you is called the floods. Uh,石头神话. Um. This poem is translated by Chao Teck Sing. Um, he's a Chinese poet as well in Singapore. The flood, the floods of Noah, the floods of Gilgamesh, the floods of Yu the Great, the Xia Chinese legendary king, and the Bu's people were unable to move. The stones of Sisyphus, Madam Nara, no, Madman Naranath, and Yu Yu Gong the Chinese mythological master named Foolish. The Chinese version, Shi Tou Shen Hua, Hong Shui, No Ya the Hong Shui, Ji Er Jia Mei She the Hong Shui, Da Yu the Hong Shui, Chong Bu Zou, Si Si Fu Si the Shi Tou, Narana the Shi Tou, Da Yu the Shi Tou. Thank you.
Thank you so much, JPL. First the student, and then the master. So, well, you know, uh, my fellow Singaporean writer, Heng Seok Tian, uh, is a very highly regarded poet. Uh, she's published five collections of poetry, including in one epic year, two different collections in one year. Uh, she's uh, been all over the world to read and to perform her writing, uh, and uh, she's also been a fellow of the Iowa uh, uh, International Writing Program. So please give a very warm Singapore welcome, <laughs> Heng Seok Tian. All right, I'm so glad you are here. I, I think I must correct a few, you know, misperceptions. Uh, firstly, I think Jupiter is too kind. I wish I could claim credit that I taught him directly. He acknowledged me because I was a high school teacher at the same college. However, I can claim credit for teaching some students who are here. So I'm very grateful that they're here to give me support, finally, in a capacity, not just as a teacher, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much for um, coming. It's, it's overwhelming you know, to, to see so many people at a poetry reading. Um, I'm actually going to try and read uh, one poem from each collection. Um, usually I write short poems, so I'll just choose. I actually chose the shortest possible because I'm very pragmatic being the teacher, right? It's the time of the night, you know? You have had a long day. The poor organizers have had a long day, you know? We want to cut them some slack, you know? So I'll choose the shortest poem, but I do want to read one longish poem, so I'll, I'll prep you mentally. Um, um, on a more serious note, I do have basically just one major preoccupation in my poetry. Um, explorations, and that's about the tension of being a um, more conservative uh, kind of Chinese um, who is brought up right, in a very uh, more protective Chinese um, environment where my parents are not literate, but my mother being a very brilliant woman, uh, born ahead of her time, my late mother, um, insisted that we have an English education. Um, that is why I could use, speak and write English. But being brought up in a non-English um, speaking environment, having to speak uh, a different dialect, um, do race, all, right? all these kind of questions. And that's why my poems deal with the tension of this kind of clash, as well as the medium of language. I'll read um, this short poem from the first collection called Crossing the Chopsticks which is already out of print, finally. <laughs> Alright, this is chopsticks. A pair of chopsticks squints at me. My pragmatics teach me Western convenience in fork and spoon. My parents frown at my cultural unrespectability in crossing the chopsticks. There is an etiquette for handling chopsticks, handling lives. Suddenly, how to handle chopsticks involves a moral dimension. Um, the second short poem is from the second collection, My City, My Canvas. Also finally out of print. <laughs> After a long, long time, I think. This is called, um, this is titled Between. Um, there are some references, maybe for the benefit of uh, our audience, I'll just um, make a quick um, explanation. Oolong is a type of Chinese tea. Um, we have always been accused of using English in a singlish manner. Why should I say accused? Okay, I do not know why. Okay, give me some time. Okay, but that's singlish. This is called Between. You want me to row a dragon boat to the beat of tradition. You want me to drum to your lion dance. I forgot to ask you if you would sip oolong with the blues I enjoy and hear me recite beat poetry punctuated with singlish twang. Um, this third poem is written as my response to the very reclusive American poetess Emily Dickinson, who once wrote, This is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. So when I was at IWP, I spent the whole three months writing back to her. <laughs> this poem is entitled Good Morning Breakfast. There's one reference, again, for the benefit of my students who may not know. 
I refer to Amherst, that's the place where um, Dickinson spent many of her years, I think, right? right. Yes, okay. that's Amherst. Okay. Good morning, breakfast. Hawkeye Drive, Iowa City. Unused to morning dose of cereals with milk or sliced cheese on wheat bread or bacon and eggs. Used to bihun and fish cake or nasi lemak or prata, market style. My small stomach churns confusion to give off inelegant gas. My bower wreaks havoc. And now, toilet seated, while I once would have squatted with countryside manners, with all the due respect, I think of Emily. Now, now, what did you have for breakfast at Amherst? I'm afraid now I need to um, adjust the mood a bit and go into a more slightly serious, sober mood. But again, for a good reason. Um, this is um, the longest, one of the longest poems I've um, ever tried, attempted. It is a seven-part poem. In when I wrote this, it's for my mother. But now I'm reading this in memory of her. Um, I just lost her this year. So please pardon me if I um, pause. This is um, part five. It is a conversation I imagine I have with her. Um, in my mind, I guess, because I can't imagine talking to her English. She wouldn't understand, but I think she would be able to feel it. Mother thinks I grew up on Chinese. She thinks my work is child's play. Between her chores, my salary, I form a trio of a gig. One in a water sleeve, swaying iambic. One in a denim, jiving romances of red chambers. One murmuring with borrowed tongues, decaying in sepia score sheets. I boogie woogie with pink dragons, shadow dance with words, holding out, holding out. Is my movement a myth? I lived among men and great ruins. My soul is shattered along capes and islands. Unlike Odysseus, my body is not good enough for heroic myths. Learning to read words, I use them as prayer flags to embalm my broken bones. Asking forever questions, forever unanswered. Names, setters, I met them in my other worlds, bringing them home for dinner to my shocked mother, who fed us with fish, sweet sour pork, unsure if they understand why we slurp from a shared pot of steamy soup. Is work and armour I wear, a shield I bear, to unjouse a real war within? Is marriage like a Russian roulette, like drawing a sword, no longer a beautiful exile in a bedroom? As a globe tracker on a one-way ticket, I calligraphy conversations with Lao Tzu. Sail scenic in a lone boat, ride with huskies and on dirt tracks. I carry home the views of glacier purity, sharp sheets of crystal aesthetic. I look for bodhi trees, but find those dripping cherries. I begin jeep jogging, guided by the light that reaches green gullies. Between my ashrams and shrines, I see my hollow, hollow life next to suffering men, long-suffering wives, yearning for the clarity that ages hold steady, that sages hold steady on the arches of their nose. I bent over 
under the weight of my frailty. That's the end. Um, thanks. That's taken from um, the fourth collection, um, is My Body a Myth, which is embossed, thanks to my publisher, who's a very thoughtful publisher. Um, and that you can only feel it, but it's only when you flip open that you can actually see the title. And also this um, red string represents the string that we wear at the Chinese funeral. Um, when we leave, we, we, we tie the string there as a sign of good luck. I'll end finally with another very short poem in um, another collection, Mixing Tongues. Again, it deals with um, having to um, inhabit and use a language that um, I have to acquire for a pragmatic reason so that I can teach English and earn a livelihood. <laughs> this is entitled Once Upon a Tongue. Okay, I was trying to play around with the Once Upon a Time um, expression. It's very short. Um, it's deliberately written in couplets. Um, my allusion to um, the more the, the form associated more with, with Chinese Chineseness. Yeah. Once upon a time, she dabs her palm in sauce, like and dark soya. She dips her pen nip inside salad dressings, English and European. Her body she boils in homemade brews. Once upon a tongue, blood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xiao. Uh, because she's my friend, so I, I, I dispense with the full name. I call her Xiao. Yeah, she's a good friend. Uh, thanks for sharing those so heartfelt and, and, and powerful poems. So friends, uh, we have one more reader to round up this night of epic international poetry. And it's my pleasure to introduce Lin Din to you. He is a Vietnamese... American writer who has published uh, uh, five collections of poetry and, and short stories and a novel called, um, I, f I forgot the name of the novel, <laughs> L Love Like Hate. And he's got a new book coming out as well. It's a book of political writings coming out in January this year. Uh, please give it up for Lin Din. Um. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here among such great company um, and to see such an enthusiastic audience. It, it really is rare to see so many people coming out for poetry <laughs> because poetry is uh, difficult. Um, the first piece is called The Difficulties of Poetry. <laughs> okay. This poem was written underwater in a steel bubble surrounded by blind and asexual fish. <laughs> this poem was composed jointly by a deaf man and a mute woman, two strangers tied together naked in a dusty abandoned house. This poem was not written but flung onto the tent wall of a field hospital by a soldier about to die. No, 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 no. This poem was incised in concrete, in sub-freezing temperature, in complete darkness. This poem was sketched with tinted dirt. No, it was transmitted with bird sounds by a decomposing corpse. Actually, this poem has not been written under the best of conditions. The lamp had a green bias. The day was overcast. This is only my second time in Singapore, and the first time was only a few hours. Um, on the way back to the airport, 
the taxi driver told me all about my future, you know. <laughs> and he got really into it, very in-depth, and I was amazed because he got nothing right, you know. <laughs> but it was kind of terrifying because I wasn't sure. Um, so what I liked most was his authority, you know. It's like he knew more about me than I know about myself. So, so this, is a, this is directly inspired by that, that taxi driver in Singapore. So, uh, in, you know, the horoscope is 12 months, right? So this is 13. You are often hunched over in an armchair to confide sweet nothings to the side of a face. In this sense, you resemble a bassoon. Though you expect the most extravagant praises for the most trivial accomplishments, you shun and despise those who view you favorably. As sunlight slants down on another late afternoon, you are strumming on a guitar, eating shepherd's pie and sipping rum lace coffee. Always bitterly exuberant, you see life as a pink spade swathing a yellow spadix. Tonight, standing in a musty hallway, you will speak your penultimate line with some dignity. You are often seen in profile at the top of a stairs, listening to a distant music. Your hair is bouffant in the front, flat in the back. Your best view is three quarters. A minute or two after midnight, champagne will spill from your fragrant mouth. As you bend down to retrieve a long lost favor, someone seizes you by the shoulder. You are such a master at aestheticizing your crimes that even your victims are grateful to be included in the horrible photographs. Inducing doubt and self-hatred in all those you come into contact with. You are a cancer and a pig. When a stream of your indulgent reveries is nixed by unpleasant ghastly image, you let out a high C and touch yourself immodestly. A straight line is easy enough you hear in a dream, but it is not possible to draw a perfect circle. You smirk at this provocation. Waking up, you work all night on an endless piece of paper, drawing circle after circle, each one wobbly, obloy, squarish, rectangular. Some are outright triangles. <coughs> Trying to peel away your fingers, someone pleads, let go of me. But you are always beyond discretion. Like every other human being, you crave a single moment of absolute exposure. Today will be your day. Your veins will pop out. <laughs> Overhearing where I come from, people don't. You punch the speaker, a blind elderly immigrant, in the face, knocking two teeth out, before you yourself are knocked unconscious by a blunt instrument from behind. Waking up days later, you are told by a lugubrious dog that he too has often slept through the best moments. In the men's room of a small town bus terminal, you discover your oil portrait in a trash can. You cut the canvas out, then stuff your folded face into your back pocket. Later, you notice with irritation that where your nose should be is just a clay pipe and your mouth is just a hole. You cannot understand the story of a youth who falls in love with his own reflection in a spring. Where you are, water doesn't reflect. Nothing reflects. One's view of oneself is made up entirely of other people's verbal slanders. Told by your employer to buy a new shirt. You respond, 
To buy a new shirt, sir, is to assume that I have at least two more years to live. Such presumptuousness cannot go unpunished. <laughs> What's more, there will be this outlandish incongruity between a brand new shirt and my already worn out body. Such an incongruity would cause my entire being, every single cell, to feel an unspeakable shame. A shame not on the skin, but in the skin. A shame to bring on my early death. You wake up to a jungly tune. On the ceiling is a water stain showing your mother's face in three-quarter view. A suspicious fluid drips on your forehead. You wish there were a hand the size of an umbrella to protect you from all of this fresh degradation. I actually managed to write another a piece from a single uh, Singapore half trip. Oh. So <laughs> hopefully this time there'll be more poems because I have a few days here. Thank you, Singapore. Um, I wrote a series of uh, one-sentence uh, stories. Uh, I also written one-sentence uh, uh, poems. So this is one of the one-sentence stories. These are kind of uh, labor-saving uh, uh, literature. Uh, a boy was born on the luggage carousel at Singapore's Changi Airport. Spent his infancy in the storage room of the baggage claim grew into a happy, healthy child prancing around the beautiful atrium of the food court, often serenaded by classical music, had regrettably brief friendships with people of many nationalities, had sex for the first time with a backpacker of indeterminate ethnicity behind the check-in counter of the Royal Brunei Airlines Terminal 2, read the biography of Lee Kuan Yew and many bestsellers, spent much of his middle age brooding in the departure lounge, then died of abnormal hernia um, in a well scrubbed star of the men's room. Um, three more poems. Um, this next one is called The Most Beautiful Word. It's from my first book of, um, of poetry, uh, All Around What Empties Out. Uh, some of my work is also uh, very um, focused on language, uh, perhaps because I'm not at home in any language. Um, I also write in Vietnamese, and um, I spent you know, three years in Europe. I'm teaching in German, Germany now. So, you know, here's another displacement. There's a guy in uh, Leipzig who sells me sausages, and every time he sees me, he tries to speak Vietnamese to me. And he doesn't make, I can't understand a single word, but I applaud his, uh, his courage, at least, right? And also his, uh, uh, his sweetness, you know, to try to communicate with me. Uh, it's called The Most Beautiful Word. I think vesicle is the most beautiful word in the English language. He was lying face down, his shirt burnt off, back steaming. I myself was bleeding. There was a harvest of vesicles on his back. His body wept. Yaw may be the ugliest. Don't say the bullet yaw inside the body. Say the bullet dance inside the body. Say the bullet tumble forward and upward. Light slanted down. All the lesser muscles in my face twitch. I flip my man over gently, like an impatient lover, careful not to fracture his C-spine. Dominoes clank under crusty skin. Clack, clack. A collapsed face stared up. There was a pink spray in the air, then a brief rainbow. The mandible was stitched with blue threads to the sole. I extract a tooth from the tongue. He had swallowed the rest. Oh, 
um, this is a kind of a commercial break, you know. Uh, it's called Brand New Products. brand new products. A vigilant gun that always picks out the right target, even if it's you, no matter who you are aiming at. A computer that listens and blows you as you blow it to your favorite tune. Meat that cleans your teeth as you masticating it. A truck so awesome, only the President of the United States of America is allowed to careen in it to his own beat. A dictionary with positive adjectives only. A dictionary with no wet verbs. A dictionary with negotiable definitions. A dictionary that defines words by their antonyms. All the greatest hits from the last millennium performed live on stage on the inside of your state-of-the-art acoustically enhanced skull. A complete set of nude photos of you taken by you and sold back to you at a discount. <laughs> a sex doll with a mirror for a face. A sex doll with a PhD. A sex doll with adjustable skin tones. A sensitive sex doll that just wants to be friends. A platonic sex doll. Rainwater in a bottle, sunshine in a box, and ambient sounds from a bus stop. Down the street, recorded on a CD. A 24-hour video of what you did yesterday. A 24-hour video of what you do tomorrow. A super realistic photo of what's outside your window, pasted to your window. <laughs> a baseball game that never ends, to be played simultaneously with a football game that never ends. Cluster bombs that scatter copies of leaves of grass over a thousand mile radius for a thousand years. Landmines made with dough, topped with mozzarella, and all your favorite toppings. An airplane that never lands. And finally, your favorite fairy tale painted on your new plastic limbs. Okay. Um, I'll finish with a true story, okay? Um, This is called my, uh, my Grandfather the Exceptional. This is a true story about my grandfather. He walked a thousand miles from his native village. He didn't intend to go that far. He had wanted to walk maybe one, at most two miles, but before he knew it, he had walked a thousand miles from his native village. After each mile, there appeared a new village each one utterly different from any place he had seen before. At each village, he settled down until they either threatened or politely asked him to move on. He would work at whatever job that was available. He was, at various times, a barber, a woodcutter, a sculptor, a slave, a moneylender, a, a beggar, a politician, a policeman, a thief. He learned new costumes, new slang, new ways of standing up, of sitting on a chair, of sneezing, of scratching his nose. He got new haircuts. Without being aware of it, he learned to dissimulate his true likes and dislikes. He became over-eager to please. He also became hyper-conscious of every single detail of his increasingly abnormal body. He accrued many unpleasant nicknames. Occasionally, he would fall in love, be rejected, reject in turn, propose, get married, father children, legitimate and illegitimate, divorce and reconcile. 
Once he was drafted into an army and fought bravely against an enemy whom he half suspected to be men from his original village. He was captured by these enemies, then repatriated in a prisoner exchange. At another village, he was anointed a poet laureate, although he could not speak the local language. Finally, at his last village, he looked around and was relieved to find out he was no longer exceptional. Because all old men look alike, disgusted and disgusting, he was finally welcomed into the fraternity of those waiting to die. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Lindin. Fantastic poetry and fantastical as well. Okay, friends, I don't know about you, but I think that we've achieved our objective of having an epic international poetry reading tonight. Do you agree? That was fantastic. Thank you all so much. I think, I think that great poetry belongs to everybody. Tonight's event was a free event, part of the SWF 2015. If you enjoyed it, these authors, these wonderful authors are still here this week uh, participating in various discussions and readings. Please come back this week and get a festival pass and come right in. Uh, there are almost 300 or, or more uh, e events on this week till the next weekend. Okay, so promise me you'll come back. All right, uh, and uh, before we wrap up tonight, I just want to say another big thank you to the Arts House, the British Council, all our great um, readers from all over the world. Would you just come up here right now? And um, this is your Instagram moment. Take a photo, please. Take a bow. Yeah, if you want to take a photo, please do so. Take a bow, guys. Uh, you're awesome. Yes, and thank you all. Every single one of you for staying. It was an awesome evening. My name is Aaron Lee. Good night and goodbye. <laughs>